standing in the fire, navigating the front lines of activist art making while female. Images wield tremendous power, entering your nervous system and touching parts of you that rhetoric cannot. A charged object can haunt a viewer as their subconscious works to unpack it. Art might not change the world, but it does instigate, nudge the conversation along, and ultimately advances civilization. Artists can do this because they prioritize being free. Society relies upon us to stand up and tell difficult truths, as many of them cannot. Because they have jobs they're not willing to risk, families they don't want to embarrass, they don't want to stand out, risk being wrong, or jeopardize future opportunities by offending someone. The extrasensory receptors artists possess can be a burden. Sometimes sensitivities are even classified as disabilities, but they're also superpowers. We make connections others may not and can often feel what is happening even when the rumble is miles away. Instinctually, we yell out a warning that something is coming. This happens whether others are listening or not because creating is simply our way to process and make sense of the world. I'm on the autism spectrum. Actually, we all are. It's a spectrum. I'm sensitive to light, sound, and the emotions and energies of those around me. Since childhood, I've been driven to call out the elephant in any given room, especially if it involves an injustice, something that's not the way it's supposed to be. I don't consider it a pathology, but a voice that's needed to steer our distracted neurotypical society back on course. I was raised Catholic. My father was in the seminary before he married and reared us on books, films, and Socratic conversations to instill a sense of absolute unflappable integrity and critical thinking skills. I recall watching Song of Bernadette and Joan of Arc as a girl and longing to be a saint or a martyr. I think I chose this vocation because it was the one activity where I could maintain my own impossible standards without compromise. At age nine or 10, I recall being in the back seat of the station wagon with the broken door along with two younger siblings. Our frequent route home included a 360 degree cloverleaf highway. As we rounded the curve, my sibs would slide across the seat, pressing against me. I chose that same spot every time because when the centrifugal force pulled on the door, I'd be ready to silently brace my feet against the front seat, using all of my 55 pounds to hold the heavy metal barrier between us and the racing pig pavement shut so we wouldn't all fall out like marbles. So now on news induced insomnia nights, I lie awake in bed trying to conjure art that must save the world. I wish I was kidding. My subject matter was personal for the first 20 years of art making. No one paid much attention when I told the unvarnished truth about my dysfunctional family. But the minute I trained my focus on the world, trouble ensued. I've worked most of my life without a gallery, but I had one in 2006 when I fought a relentless inner voice telling me I must make an assumption painting until I finally figured out how to realize it. It was the first time I looked beyond my own psyche to comment on society at large. The painting was in every major newspaper in the world before the paint was dry and the Miami Art Fair opened. I got my first phone threats from enraged Christians and we put an alarm in our house. While initially exciting, ultimately the attention I got for this painting was mostly of the vulgar pop culture variety, the very system I was critiquing. My definition of success has always been respect from people I respect. So I rolled up and put away the next similar painting in progress forever, rather than capitalizing on the interest, churning out more and hiring a publicist, as many suggested I do. I went back to making personal work for six years, plenty of time to process the lessons from that first experience of social commentary art making. The next time I felt a force demanding my attention, it was stronger. 
With bully culture, I was ready to channel this difficult body of work. The freedom required to undertake this series happened in stages. My father, who'd always followed my work, had just passed away. I'd stopped actively looking for full-time academic positions. I no longer cared about what people thought of me, not even art world people. I was free to express what it feels like to exist in this time and place, to try and make sense of the insane world I was living in. I was ready to call it all out and stand in the fire of the consequences. There's a stereotype that becoming a mother takes one's edge off. But for me, thinking about the future my daughter must navigate intensified my practice. I became impatient with subtle art. This moment demanded a primal scream. In 2010, after my daughter's birth, I began researching the psychology behind all of the societal ills and injustices that kept me up at night. Hashtag bully culture is an umbrella term I coined for the aggressive forces in our society that exist on a spectrum. I call out perpetrators in many disparate areas that we usually classify according to victim and made an argument through the cumulative body of work that perpetrators and defenders of misogyny, racism, abusive animals, corporate sociopathy and environmental destruction are often one and the same. Ultimately, the work foreshadowed the Me Too movement, the 2016 election, and the ugly aftermath of emboldened racism. I sometimes shocked myself by what I was making, yet I never had such conviction for a series before. My first gun liquor painting was featured in a Huffington Post blog in fall of 2015. I was trolled heavily. Men like this on Facebook and Instagram regularly send me friend requests just to show me that they exist out there, often in full militia gear with piles of guns. I simply screen grab their profile image, file it, then block and forget them. One night I saw this post featuring an image with a bandaid over my daughter and my heart stopped. I thought I'd purge the internet of all her public photos, but they'd found it in, in an old interview. I texted the image to a male friend, one who supported my work for decades. He said I was sort of asking for it by making the paintings. It made me ponder whether anyone has ever told a male artist that they were asking for it. Did male artists even get these kinds of threats in the first place? I have a file with the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center. I maintain folders for hate mail, threats, and screen grabs. I routinely comb the internet to remove our address. For safety's sake, I was asked to keep my studio address out of the public eye after a man raged against my art during an open studio and had to be escorted out. Google alerts often lead me to things like this 4chan post, but the most disconcerting is when my name's embedded in a disturbing sentence, but when I follow the link, I don't have access to the private site. When I find something especially scary and express concern about the crazies, I've often been shamed, called ridiculous, told that no one ever harms artists, and accused of acting self-important and trying to call attention to my work. Most of all, I've learned how to breathe through discomfort. The first time I exhibited this body of work, the opening was packed, but the room was deadly silent. I had no idea what it meant, and I was crawling out of my skin. I now understand that people need to time to process this work, and then they really want to talk about it. We added extra wall text to the show. The head of the department and artist himself wanted this piece taken down. The local paper's review warned viewers of not just nudity, but male nudity. And I would add created by a woman who was not reversing the gaze in a sexy way, but calling out rape culture. Some great artist curators, Matthew Clay Robison and Jim Arendt bravely brought the work to their university galleries, carefully paving the way for it 
and negotiating any impacts. In late 2018, I ordered my first counterfeit MAGA hats, ripped them apart, and then manipulated the pieces into objects that function as corrective physical manifestations of the truth, revealing the hat's essential nature and the wearer's complicity in the atrocities of this administration. I remember thinking that this initial MAGA object simply had to exist in the world, and so I might as well be the one to make it. I got banned from Facebook, an archive of my artistic practice. When the platform was gone, I felt like I'd been disappeared in some dystopian novel. I wrote a piece about the censorship for Medium. Some news venues picked it up. I got my page back and Jen Tuff, a San Francisco gallerist, saw the work and offered me a solo show. I was thrilled. I'd been making this work confident that someday I'd find a gallerist who saw value in it and was brave enough to take it on. The next day, I saw a hate hat posted on a Fox Instagram page with ugly comments about Jen's gallery, me, and threats to spray paint the work. I showed Jen telling her, it's okay if you change your mind. She moved the exhibition to a secure secret location and made it a weekend long pop-up. The gallery got threatening phone calls. Her husband put in extra security cameras. I bought her staff pink tasers. After a Huffington Post article mentioned the threats, the owners of the pop-up building had reservations about her using the space. She bought extra insurance. Next, I received a letter addressed to me at the gallery. It began with a graphic verbal sexual assault. Again, imagine Leon Golub receiving such a letter. Jen took the letter to the police and told the clearly conservative officer that they'd also received threatening phone calls. He decided there was nothing to worry about. They would not be making any extra drives past the gallery. Every day I wondered when Jen would decide the emotional roller coaster was just not worth dealing with. She hired three men to protect the art in the building. I hired a bodyguard for opening night, but I didn't tell anybody about it. We both sunk a lot of money into the show because of the early publicity momentum, but as it grew closer, she became concerned. Although there were many press requests to follow up on the show from the earlier coverage, she kept the press away and made the show by, R by RSVP only to avoid the wrong kind of attention. The exhibition opened with great art community and social media support and without incident, but didn't even appear as an art listing in the San Francisco papers. We both spent three months preparing for a big event that became a secret underground exhibition spread by word of mouth because of intimidation. Mainstream media focus is a double-edged sword and managing it to your advantage requires extreme finesse. After a recent Zoom interview with a DC museum curator, several conservative board members complained and wanted the archive video taken down. The director got involved and it remained with a warning. One of the things that bothers me most about what I do is that people who try to support my work often encounter hassles for doing so. Yet I'm so grateful to them because many major online places where art lovers go to discover new talent only want innocuous art that won't lose them any followers. I now maintain a list of the risk averse, so I don't waste my time with submissions. Responses to challenging work raises all kinds of questions about arts educations in our school. One man asked who was paying me to make my gun liquor paintings. Imagine envisioning profit as the only possible motivator for art making. The crux of the problem for our activist work is context. Only one quarter of Americans step inside museums each year. Most art exists inside a controlled and closed system and many political artists work stays safely inside the system, preaching to the converted. When viewers enter the portal of a museum or gallery, they're prepared to be challenged. But ideally, if you wanna 
are to instigate change, it must become a part of public discourse. When top tier artists do challenging public work, they're protected. They have an army of arts writers, gallerists, and curators to facilitate the difficult conversations between their work and the public. At my level, you do most of that work on your own. The men who troll me didn't enter an art space. They were online when suddenly confronted by the work. While the internet has democratized art, giving us access to a broader audience, provocative work presented without context can elicit anger or trauma from those who aren't accustomed to being challenged by art. And while some of these works took me months or years to execute, online to a layman in this culture, they become just another meme. But not every political artist gets the same responses. In contrast to my experience, artist Mike Bryan told me the most surprising thing for me is how little negative feedback I get. The Trump troll input is not really threatening or scary, more like we think you're talented, but don't like your politics. Interestingly, in 2004, Berkeley artist Guy Caldwell painted The Abuse, a work depicting the atrocities of Abu Ghraib. And it was not him, but Laurie Hay, the female owner of the gallery showing the work, who received 200 angry emails, voicemails, and death threats. Her gallery was damaged, she was spit on, and another man punched her in the face, knocking her out, breaking her nose, and causing a concussion. Hay closed the gallery permanently. It appears that women are easier targets for those who seek to silence political commentary. Two Venezuelan artists, Deborah Castillo and Erica Ordoscotti, had to flee their country when government leaders called them out on TV and threats of kidnapping, rape, and death followed. While a scenario like this would have been unthinkable in the US years ago, Trump now uses Fox and Twitter as a dog whistle to militias about his perceived enemies. Since the failed plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, I no longer see online threats as harmless. Susan Sontag once wrote, he who transgresses not only breaks a rule, he goes somewhere that the others are not and he knows something the others don't. The obstacles and complexities involved in creating this kind of work require specific constantly shifting contortions. Both inside and outside the art wor world, cynics would dismiss controversial art as a publicity stunt because so much of our celebrity culture operates this way. Supporters often cheer, don't let the trolls silence you, Kate, with little regard for the fact that there are very real safety issues at stake. This is not just some abstract principle for me. When an artist starts making difficult work, it's not like the Artist Protection League automatically sends you a few thousand dollars for security upgrades. And when well-intentioned friends say, we've got your back, they mean that they might pen a comeback to an online troll, not that they'll take turns guarding our house at night. But who is going to call these bullies out if everyone wants to stay safe and keep their heads down? Many helpful souls advise me to simply stop making this work. And to be frank, I often wish that I could. Yet if I tried to make anything else, the art that needs to be made now, now would sit on my shoulder and whisper in my ear reminding me every second that I'm wasting my time on some sort of cheap compromise substitute. And to what end? I'd go crazy if I wasn't able to process information and embody my experience through the creation of objects. And while I protest, write letters, and make guerrilla stickers, none of these actions are as effective as arts reach. I consider it a privilege that I've been tapped on the shoulder driven to make this work right now. Being bullied for calling out bullies is part of the process towards manifesting positive change. For the sake of my emotional well-being, I try to view opposition as a measure of the work's effectiveness. No one surrenders power willingly. And as Berto Brecht once said, art is not a mirror held up to reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. Thank you.